किस चीज के बारे में बता रहे हैं ना कोविड Hello there. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming to the online session. Uh, can I just ask if everybody can hear my voice clearly? Yes. 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 It's okay. okay. Excellent. Yes, doctor. It's clear. Excellent. So we're going to um, uh, do some ground rules before we start. Uh, I would appreciate if everyone can put their Zoom on mute. The reason being because they, I am expecting a lot of participants to join in shortly. Uh, if somebody has any questions, we will obviously give them time to come and comment, and then I've, they can unmute as well. Uh, so that would be useful for the house rules management. Okay, excellent. So first of all, thank you, thank you, everyone, uh, because everyone who is here, they mean that they are quite keen on learning on the OSCE stations and the tricks about how to pass OSCE. Now, remember, it's not a difficult exam. There is a, the reason it becomes a difficult exam is just because we don't know what we're dealing with. Once we know the rules of the game, the rules of the OSCE, then it becomes easier to play uh, to win this. Okay, so Rob, right. So just a bit of introduction. Uh, so my name is Dr. Mashrut Kazi. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants. Um, I graduated from Pakistan, then I spent 12 years working in UK. I've done specialist training in emergency medicine in UK. Did my MR chem in 2013, then did my FR chem in 2016. I've also done my MPH, Masters of Public Health and Diploma in Public Health. I was the teaching lead in the London Hospital where I was last working. I, I was also a teaching lead in the Alain Hospital in UAE where I was working last year. Currently, I'm working in Tabam, which is a tertiary hospital in Alain, which is Abu Dhabi, uh, Emirates of Abu Dhabi, and I'm part of the faculty over there. So I have a keen interest on passing on the knowledge for OSCEs to candidates. The reason I want to do it free of charge is when I looked around, uh, there are a lot of OSCE training uh, courses all around the world. Most of them happen in Dubai, London, Saudi Arabia. But most of them are charging a lot of fees. There's nothing wrong with asking for candidates to pay them a good fee if they're providing a good service. But some of the fees, I think it's quite, quite a lot. One of the courses I looked at was asking $800. The other one is asking for $1,500. What we do forget is uh, when the candidate is at the level of trying to pass an OSCE exam, they have other commitments as well. Anyways, so that was a basic background why we wanted to do this. So we're going to do a very uh, time uh, specific schedule. The first half an hour, which is right now, we're going to talk about what is OSCE, how do we prepare for OSCE exams, and do we need to respect the OSCE exam? and what is actually an OSCE exam constitutes. The reason I want to discuss this right now at the start is, uh, once you know the importance of OSCE and the importance of basics of in OSCE, uh, then it becomes really easy to apply those basics in the rest of the OSCE exams, okay? So the reason uh, we have an OSCE uh, so the, the, the OSCE essentially is a practical exam, as we all know. So once you are at the level of the OSCE, whether you are doing a PLAP OSCE or an MR Chem OSCE or an FR Chem OSCE, that essentially means that the examiners have already judged your uh, background knowledge by their written exams, right? So what they're not keen on is judging again your clinical knowledge, because that's been done previously. What they're more focused upon is finding out whether you are a safe physician, whether you can practice safe medicine, whether you are compassionate towards your patient, whether you can communicate clearly with your patient. And if you can do all of these things, then there's no reason why you shouldn't pass an OSCE exam. 
the main reason why candidates fail off ski exam is the first thing they're underprepared they're underprepared to attempt the OSCE exam. They're not underprepared from the clinical knowledge because they, are, they, they have already been tested, but they are underprepared as how to tackle the OSCE examinations. So there are certain keys which are quite basics, right? When you go to an OSCE exam, before, just before, prior to the OSCE exam, 48 hours prior to the OSCE exam, you need to stop stressing about the exams. The last 48 hours before your exam should be the most peaceful time because you need to be mentally relaxed before your exam. All the hard work should be done prior to 48 hours. And mind you, it involves a lot of hard work to pass in OSCE exams. That comes to the point you have to respect this exam. Once you start respecting the, this exam, the, why do you have to respect the exam? The reason you have to respect this exam is once a candidate clears the OSCE, either at a plat level, if they, cut, uh, they clear the OSCE at the plat level, they get a license to practice in the UK. If they, part, if they clear an OSCE at an MR chem level, they automatically transition from a junior doctor to a senior doctor, either in uh, become a specialist or a senior registrar. And most important, if, somebody, if a candidate passes an FR chem OSCE, most likely they are transitioned into a consultant position. So, so in, in all likelihood is a transition, is a very important exam in any candidate's lifetime. It was certainly true in my case. The PLAT exam was extremely important for me. MR chem was extremely important. And FR chem literally changed my life for good. So hence, you have to respect the exam. Okay, so what things we need to do for OSCE exam? The main take home message, which we're gonna drill on today, is communication, communication, and communication. You have to be really good in your communication skills. Because in all the OSCE stations, the one thing that stands out is how a candidate communicates with the, can with the patient in front of them, or how do they communicate the plan of action, the differential diagnosis. So you need to be a good communicator. Now, communication itself is a very broad field, but I would like, what I would try to do is narrow it down to a few basic things. Remember, if you're focusing on PLAP exam, MR chem, and FR chem, you need to understand that these are exams which are based for the British culture. The examiners who sit on these exams work in the British culture. The candidate, the, uh, the patients or the actors who come for the exam are probably from British background. So for them, the British culture becomes really important. So what is a British culture? If you narrow it down to simple words, British culture, you have to, in British culture, you have to be really polite towards your patient. As a physician, you need to be extremely polite. You need to be speaking to them in very clear, simple English language words. You don't have to be a British born English first, your language shouldn't, you, it's not necessary that your language should be English, first language should be English. If you can communicate clearly, simply in English language, it's more than enough to pass the OSCE exam. But in the exams, in the OSCEs, you need to be polite, you need to be clear, you need to have a clear thought process in your mind before you go into an OSCE scenario. You need to read carefully what the scenario is asking you for. I've seen a lot of candidates. I've myself made a lot of mistakes because in the pressure of the OSCE exams, what the, the last thing you want to do is waste your time reading the uh, presentation outside the station. But if you spend 15, 20 extra seconds on reading that information and absorbing the information, what they're asking you to do, then you would be mentally prepared in a better way to go and tackle the station, right? So you have to look at all the uh, information which is relayed there. Spend your time, spend your one minute, read it for 30 seconds, absorb for the next 10 seconds, and then for the last 20 seconds, you have to make a plan. What do I need to do? 
what is the station asking me to do what is the key point in the station which i need to elicit what is the underlying diagnosis or the thing that the examiner wants me to crack and what are the things which i cannot miss in this station so i hope that is clear that spending a few extra seconds outside your station waiting to the scenario makes a hell of a lot of a difference most of the candidates when they go in they go in they have read the station but they have not grasped the information they go in then they start asking the examiner can i have a listen can i look at the station uh, again so that gives you a very bad impression to the examiner all right so that's the first point second point now these OSCE stations are back to back one station after it finishes and you go on to the next station and go on to the next station you will have one or two stations break in the middle but most of them they're one after the other consecutive stations so whatever happened in your last station has to remain in that station you have to let go of that whatever has happened if something really bad has happened for example um, you have given the wrong diagnosis you've given the wrong plan and you've just realized you've given the wrong plan uh, and you haven't answered the, uh, the, uh, the patient's concerns but but you have to remember that's happened now that's happened in the past you cannot carry on that thought process whatever's happened into the next station because what will happen if you carry on that thought process into the next station it's simple you you're gonna get confused you're not going to have a clear thought process for the next station so second take-home message whatever happened in the last station you just have to forget it move on start fresh for the next station what you want to do is win that station the next station even if you have lost that last station okay that's the second point now very simple things before the day of the exam before 48 hours you have to have last 48 hours before the exam you should be in the relaxed state of mind that is not the time to go and grab your books that is exactly not the time when you're spending 20, 18 hours out of 24 hours practicing everything the, 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 the practice 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 reading your books practicing with your companion or your colleague attending sessions should be done before before one month two months okay last 48 hours is your time to give your mind some peace of rest okay and you need to have a good sleep for the last 48 hours before the exam you need to have look after your diet remember OSCE exam lasts anywhere between two and a, two and a half to three hours right and those three hours are really exhausting not physically Physically, some people might be, uh, some, for some candidate, it might be exhausting, but it's the mental game out here in the OSCE. It's just mental game. So your mind needs to be fresh. You need to have a full sleep before you go in. So that's the third point. You need to look after yourself just before the OSCE exam. Right, three points. Right. Fourth point, and that's the important point. I've never seen a candidate I repeat again, I've never seen a candidate pass an OSCE exam without hard work. Hard work works. Working really hard is what successful people do. Working really hard is what successful candidates do. You have to work hard. Now, it's one thing working hard, but it's other thing working hard on the right things. If you work, work really hard for the last two months before the OSCE exam, but you haven't focused on the human factors, you haven't focused on your communication skills, you haven't focused on your politeness, you haven't focused on your clear word communications. And then at the last week, somebody comes and observes you and say, hang on a minute, you should be doing this way. Hang on a minute, you should be doing this way. That's not the hard work. I mean, you, you need to work hard, but you need to know what you're working hard on. That's where communication skills holds the key. But on the day of the exam, you need to focus on your breakfast. That is the last day. What you want to do is rush off for the exam and not have your breakfast. 
because then the last, then the next three hours of your boss game, you'll be, you, you've lost the match, okay? You need to prepare yourself. You have to eat enough carbohydrates in your breakfast. Day of your OSCE exam, you should treat yourself with a very good breakfast. You should enjoy. You should give half an hour for your breakfast. Uh, some people, whatever they like, they should just make an effort or get your friends or family to make an effort for your breakfast. You need to have a uh, high calorie diet which can sustain you for the last three hours. If you are a coffee drinker, drink coffee as much as you can or as you normally do. Some people prefer tea, but that's absolutely fine. But what you don't want to do is load yourself in energy drinks, because that will drain up later on. Anyways, that was just a simple uh, tip chat. Okay, right. Coming back to the main thing, communication, right? Right. So let me just tell you, let, let me just ask, uh, okay, uh, let, let me not ask, because they have, we have uh, approximately 75 uh, participants, so I can't, Keep on asking one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask and I'll answer myself. Right, the OSCE stations. How many OSCE stations are there? Le uh, let me just uh, see if I can. All right, okay. So, right. So, let's say how many OSCE stations are there? Just one second. So there are anywhere between 16 to 18 stations. Okay, so the, uh, there's 16 to 18 stations. Out of those 16 to 18 stations, okay, you will have at least four or five history thinking stations. Okay, one has to be a breaking brand new station, okay? One has to be a psychiatry station. Two to three will be resuscitation stations. Okay, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so around two would be examination stations. And one or two would be difficult consultation or default, okay? So this is your normal OSCE, right? So if you just focus on there, about four or five history taking stations along with breaking bad news stations, site station. I count them as communication stations, right? So five, six, seven, and difficult consultation. Approximately, Eight to nine stations are purely communication skill station. I repeat again, out of this 16, approximately 16 stations, eight or nine are pure communication stations. Once you crack your communication stations, once you know how to deal with the communication station, you have cracked the OSCE exam. A candidate who cannot understand what they are expected to do in the communication stations are the one which struggle to pass the OSCE. I hope everybody passes the OSCE, but this is what you're faced with. You're faced with an exam which will give you at least eight to nine communication stations. And imagine the candidate is not comfortable with the communication skills, or they're not sure how to deal with, how to act on the communication skills. I wouldn't expect that candidate to do very well compared to a candidate who knows exactly what they expected to do in communication skills. They know exactly how to act on the communication skills, how to talk, how to behave, how to sit, uh, how to do uh, non-verbal gestures in the communication stations, how to ask the right questions, how to know the time management, because you're gonna get at least five to seven minutes where you have to polish off your station, including discussing the differential diagnosis, uh, discussing the management plan with the patient. So five to six minutes you have to be done with this. So time management, big key. 
uh, in the uh, OSCE scenarios, okay? So you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Eight to nine stations, you have to be really good, okay, right. So we've talked about how, uh, what the OSCE uh, constitutes, right? We've talk about, talked about why you have to focus on the OSCE exam, because this is a life-changing exam. Right, whether you are doing a for flat purposes, MRCAM and FRCAM, mind you, the only difference between uh, <clears throat> the plat, MRCAM and FRCAM OSCE is the slight increase in intensity. Otherwise, if you compare all these three exams, all three OSCE for these three exams, the template or the pattern of the exam is all the same. They're all focusing on finding out whether you are a safe doctor, whether you are a good communicator, whether you can do time management, whether you can make a patient comfortable or not. All right. What we're going to do is, <clears throat> once we had, uh, just a uh, just bit of a house rule, we have to break up at 5.40 uh, UA time because the Zoom session will finish uh, around about 40 minutes, and then I'll give a 10 minutes break, and I'll come back, and when I come back, I will have a, a candidate with me. Uh, I will be the candidate. I will have a patient with me. I will first demonstrate to you what we expect in the exam, what you guys should do just before the exam, what level you guys need to be at uh, during your communication OSCE. So we're gonna focus on two important OSCEs today. I think are the basics of passing uh, any OSCE exam, whether it's for PLAM, MRCAM, and FRCAM. First of all, we're going to do a breaking bad news OSCE. I've never seen an exam up till now. I'm sure there will be exam. I've never seen an exam up till now whether in which a breaking bad news OSCE hasn't come. I'm sure there will be, but I, it's never come across my mind. And I've been there, I've been involved in teaching for a very long time, right? Uh, so, uh, so breaking bad news is essential. You need to know how to break bad news uh, in the British UK NHS setup. It's not about the NHS setup. You just have to know how to break a bad news in your clinical practice. I know I've got candidates today. Um, we got approximately 80 candidates, which is quite, overwhelming because I was expecting when I launched this I was expecting five to ten candidates to just come up well uh, I've got 80 now and then uh, I had more than 400 forms I had to prioritize anyways so that's uh, admin staff to do deal with this right so breaking bad news it's not just about the NHS that you need to know how to break a bad news it's about your own clinical practice I know candidates who are in South Africa who have joined I know candidates who are in Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, uh, Kuwait, they've joined in. I know candidates who are from UK who have joined in, from Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Guana. Anywhere you practice, the basics of breaking bad news will still the same. And remember, it looks difficult from the onset. If I, when I will do it, it might just look too much for you to do it. But with practice, you guys will reach there. There's certain rules, certain steps you need to follow for any station. So we're going to do one breaking bad news today, which I will do for uh, five to ten minutes. Then we're going to do a debrief. I will explain to you step by step what I have done in breaking bad news. Uh, and then I will open it up for questions. Then each of you can ask questions. Uh, anyway, so, uh, carry on. And in the last session of the day, we will do one more communication skill, which I think is essential, which will be a history taking uh, communication skill scenario. Now the presentation will be a very straightforward one, but regardless of the presentation, it's the template you need to focus on. Uh, it's the methodology, it's the way the human factors, the non-verbal factors, the communication, the clear word communication, uh, the satisfaction of the patient, asking the concerns of the patient, addressing those concerns will be the key. It could be any uh, history station, it could be chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, 
uh, I mean, hematuria, uh, urinary frequency, nausea, vomiting, any, any complaint you can think of, you can fit into that template. And then you can apply that template in any of the history sessions. So this is what we're gonna focus on in the last part of this session today. But right now, it's just an introduction. It's about what is Oxky. Okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna ask you guys if anyone has any questions just about the basics of Oxky. What are you expected to do in Oxky? And what the Oxky constitutes? If anyone has any questions, please unmute yourself and uh, uh, just ask questions. If, uh, if not, then we'll go to carry on. Uh, hi, Dr. Mathieu, uh, it's uh, Dr. Sana here. Yes, Dr. Sana. Uh, yes, I was wondering if uh, you could give us permission to record this session on our computers, so or we can refer to it later on as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, Dr. Sana. I, I should have done this initially on the housekeeping rules, but I forgot. Thank you for reminding me. Now, feel free to record this session. I'm not charging anything. I don't believe in charging my fellow colleagues for giving on education. Process. So feel free to uh, download it on your uh, computer and review it again and again. I think that would be a good idea. But remember, rather than, uh, rather than, uh, rather than focusing on uh, downloading, uh, I will be uploading these on the YouTube, the channel I've made for you guys, where I from time to time put on my uh, from time to time I put on my uh, videos. Uh, so I will be putting on the YouTube. But if you want to still download, by all means, please download. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, Dr. Masood. Uh, this is Dr. Tazi. Yes, please. Just having one question uh, that uh, uh, what is the expectation uh, in the MRCAM OSCE and the FRCAM OSCE? Is there any difference between both of them? And uh, what is the expectation? Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Can we just uh, unmute everyone? I'm just going to answer this question. After this question, uh, after I've answered, you can unmute and ask whatever. Okay. Now, Excellent question again. Uh, MR chem, uh, MR chem and FR chem, right? Again, a very good question. Now, the basics of the OSCE are the same. I mean, in the, in the can I just ask everyone to mute, please? Uh, then once I've finished answering, you can unmute and ask any questions, okay? Thank you. Right, okay. So the basics of MR chem and FR chem are the same. Okay, just one second. Okay, the basics of MR chem and FR chem are the same. The different way that, so the, the, what is the similarity, okay? So in MR chem as well, there are a lot of communication stations. In FR chem, there are a lot of communication stations. In both of these exams, there are resuscitation stations, APLS, ALS, APLS, okay? But what is the differences? The first big difference, when you're going for an MR chem exam, the examiners or the College of Royal College of Emergency Medicine are expecting the candidates to act or to behave or to take decisions at the level of a registrar or a senior registrar or a specialist in certain parts of the world, okay? So what is the meaning of a registrar? Registrar is the deputy of the consultant. When the consultant is not around, it's like for example in the night shift, they take charge of the department. So that means they should have some leadership skills at the MRCAM level. They should have some problem solving skills at the MRCAM levels. Obviously they must have tested your clinical skills at the primary and intermediate level. But once you come to the FR chem level, the examiner of the Royal College is expecting the candidate to behave, to make decisions as a consultant. Once you start behaving or making decisions as a consultant, that essentially means that you are the head of the department. Uh, you are the head of the department. Once you're the head of the department, 
the bug stops at you. You are the problem solver. You cannot give on, pass on your problems to anybody else. You have to find solutions then and there. So this is the big difference, the mindset. The MRKM, the examiners are expecting you to behave like a specialist or registrar. The FRKM, they are expecting you guys or any candidate to behave as a consultant or make decisions as a consultant. So this is the primary difference. The second big difference between MRKM and FRKM. Now FRKM might give you a history station or communication station and they might ask you, please discuss the differential diagnosis with the patient. But at the FRKM level, they might ask you, please take a history from the patient, discuss the differential diagnosis, discuss the management plan, and further follow up with the patient. So there we go. Uh, so there's a bit of a managerial difference at FRKM level. They're asking you to manage the patient a bit more than they were expecting you to do at the MRKM level. So this is the second difference. The similarities are quite a lot. The template of communication skills is the same for MRKM and FRKM. I would go further ahead and say it's the same for the PLAT as well. But the intensity of the requirements increases gradually once you do PLAP, MRCAM, and FRCAM. Remember, once you're going for the FRCAM level, that is the ultimate exam in emergency medicine. That means you are the, that, that means you expect yourself to be the finished article in emergency medicine. That means you are ready to take on the responsibility of a consultant if. I hope you do. When you do pass the exams, you are ready to take on the role of a consultant. So this is the primary difference. But from the preparation point of view, the basics are still the same. You have to work hard. You have to know what is expected in the communication skills station. You need to know what's expected of you in the uh, resuscitation stations. These are the stations we're gonna all discuss step by step. We're gonna take small steps. We, we, what we, I, I'm not gonna take is one big step, and in the next day, I'm gonna expect you to go and pass the OSC exam. That's just unrealistic uh, expectations from you. What I want you guys to do is work with me step by step, get to know what the examiner wants you to do, what are the basics, and then you build on this. I'm, a firm, I'm not a firm believer that you can just rock up to a course one week, one week before the exam, attend two days or four days, absorb all the knowledge, and then expect yourself to go and clear the exam. It just doesn't happen. I've never seen this happen. What I expect you guys to do is take on little bit by bit every day and build on block by block. So by the end of so by the 48 hours before the exam, do you yourself know you are confident that, yes, I am the finished article. I will go and pass the OSCE. There's no one who's going to take away the OSCE from me. I know how to do OSCE. I know the basics. I have full control over me. I have practiced each station, each station 25, 30 times. It's in my autopilot. On the day of the exam, I go outside the station, I see it's a history taking chest pain, right? Within all of a second, my autopilot works, I'm ready, snap. The only thing I need to think of is, what are they asking me in that station? What are the catch in the station? What I'm not talking about, thinking about is, what questions I need to ask on that station? Because I already know, I've practiced that station 25, 30 times. I go in. Bang, I start on introduction. What is your main problem? I talk about the chief complaint. I talk about the associated symptoms. I talk about the review of systems. I talk about the past medical history, past surgical history, medication, allergies, travel history, occupation history, social history. I give them a management plan, differential diagnosis. Finish. In the end, I do a couple of catch phrases to catch me, to cover my back. I will talk about those catchphrases later on. Then last minute I'm thinking, 
Is there anything I can do more? Is there anything I can outperform the other candidates? Have I done enough to pass the exam? Yes, I have. I go on to the next station. I leave that thought, whatever happened in that station, then and there. I do not carry that on further on. This is how good you should be. And by, by, by all means, I've seen my friends, my colleagues, my candidates manage to do this. If they can do it, you guys can also do it, okay? So we've talked about uh, differences between MRK and FRK. Right, I'm just gonna ask you guys if somebody has any other questions. Uh, Hi, please. sir. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, sir. So my question is like, if we have 18 different stations, so at the start of every station, are we giving a, given a template? Like this is a history taking station, this is a resuscitation sta station, this is a bad, uh, bad breaking the bad news station. Is, is it written? Like, is it written so that we can focus on that particular thing? Or oh. no, we just have to just... Uh, I mean, we just have to decide ourselves after getting into one station and I, whether I should ask the history or this is a resuscitation one, which one. So do we get the templates while doing that or no, we have to do it on our own? Right, okay, excellent, <clears throat> lovely. Uh, another quick question. I feel really, uh, I feel overwhelmed that I am, I've got very good candidates sitting there with asking the right questions, okay? Very sensible question this is, right? How do we know what station this is? Okay, that you're gonna find out once you read the whole scenario. Now, your reading skills should be at the top peak. You should go in and read the scenario within 10 seconds, first of all, okay? Go in and just read for 10 seconds. Next 20 seconds, you should spend time on focusing what the details are. Once you read that scenario within the first 10 seconds, you will have an idea. Are they asking me to take a history? Are they asking me to break a bad news? Are they ask, is this a psychiatry station? I mean, is this an examination station? Is this a difficult consultation? Is it a difficult patient I need to deal with? Is it a teaching scenario? Okay, I'll give you an example, right? The scenario we're gonna use today, I'm just gonna give it out to you guys, okay? 55-year-old Mrs. Smith presented to the emergency department complaining of chest pain. She has past medical history of diabetes and hypertension. Vital signs are blood pressure 122 by 68 with a heart rate of 60, respiratory rate of 16, and oxygen saturations of 99% on room air. Please take a history and discuss the management plan. So once I read this scenario, within the first 10 seconds, I know, snap, it's a history station. So all of a sudden, the history template comes in front of my eyes. History template comes in, I fit few questions I need to ask. Next 20 seconds, I read again. I focus on the details. Now the details are, in this scenario, is the risk factors. She's a diabetic, she's a hypertensive. The further details are the vital signs. They're saying the blood pressure is normal, respiratory is normal, oxygen saturation is normal. So I know she's comfortable at rest. I mean, she's stable. The third thing I'm going to ask is, what is the giveaway? What is the take home they want to ask me in this? Based on this simple scenario, I know it's a history taking scenario. They're asking me to take a history. Now the examiners in the history station or communication station or any station in Nowski, are sitting there with a piece of paper with them and they have to tick certain boxes, right? In the history station, there are approximately 20 to 25 boxes that they have to tick, okay? And once you go on the OSCID day, that is not the day to find out what the ticks are. You should know those ticks or the boxes before you go into the OSCID station. I mean, a month, two months before. So you can focus on practicing your history taking skills. So that becomes second nature. Just like you sit in your car and you drive off. You put the ignition on and you just drive off. You don't think, oh, I need to put my accelerator on. I need to put the brake on. Is it automatic? Is it manual? Do you need to put a clutch on? You don't think, you just drive, okay? What are you focusing on? You're not focusing on driving. You're just focusing on hazards. 
Is this car going to turn left or right? Okay. This is how good you need to be. Once you, once you realize it's a history station, you need to just focus on, you don't have to focus on the ticks. That's autopilot, that's inbuilt, that's fitted in your memory now because you've practiced a lot. What you're focusing on is what are the examiners trying to find out for me in this station? What is the main concern of this patient? How will I make her, make her or him comfortable in this station? What will be my plan? That's all what you're thinking. Like, I'll give you one more example. That's the second scenario we're gonna do today, okay? I'm just gonna read out to you. You are the team leader working in the emergency department involved in the cardiac arrest, where a 70-year-old, 70-year-old male patient has been brought in by the paramedics in cardiac arrest. Prior to the cardiac arrest, patient complained of central crushing chest pain and he had a witness cardiac arrest in front of the paramedics who started CPR. Once the patient arrived to the department, you have continued CPR. And after carrying on for 30 minutes, uh, you have declared the patient RIP, rest in peace, okay? Please discuss this with Mr. Smith's daughter who's waiting for you in the consultation room. All right. So, I mean, it's, it's, the, the examiners, the Royal College might make you a very long scenario. There's a reason for that. They want you to, I mean, get confused, spend time, waste your one minute, okay? That's okay, because that's an exam, right? They are, it's justifiable that they are within their rights to do this, right? This is an exam, right? They're not there to help you, right? The, the, the candidates who can, read quickly, grasp what they want to ask, will win this station, okay? Now, if I read through this scenario, I know all of a sudden within 10 seconds, is a, is a breaking bad news station, right? Anybody who doesn't understand it's a breaking bad news, right? I mean, you should all know it's a breaking bad news station, right? Once you realize the breaking bad news station, that template of breaking bad news should come in front of your head in front of your eyes automatically, right? Because I expect you guys to have practiced breaking bad news at least 20, 25 times. You should be so good that if I wake, if you guys get waken up, woken up at two o'clock in the morning and somebody says, right, go and uh, discuss this breaking bad news with this patient relative. You say, all right, no problem at all, I'll be there. You go there, you have a template, you have 13, 14 points you need to hit on, you go in, you introduce yourself, you, you, you ask the identity of the other person, you make them comfortable, you ask them what, I will talk about this later on. You hit those 14 checkpoints, at the end you're comfortable, I've nailed that station, okay? In the last minute you're thinking, oh, is there anything I can ask? Can I get an extra point? Um, can I make them more comfortable? Okay, those are the things you need to get on, okay? Right, I hope that answers the question about how do we know what station it is. With practice, you should with practice and practice a lot, you should be able to understand the main theme, history taking, breaking manual, psychiatry station. Okay, right, I'll give you an example, right? <clears throat> I've read a scenario and I know it's a mental health station, right? The first thing that should click in your mind is I need to do suicidal risk assessment on this patient. Okay. That should click in your mind. And then you should then read the question again, or the scenario again. Is there anything else the examiner or the college is expecting me to find out? So you should be spending that 30 seconds finding out what they want from you, rather than going through the checklist of suicidal risk assessment. That should not be the time, okay? Anyways, <clears throat> so let's move on. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Um, uh, so, anybody wants to ask any more questions, then we're going to move on uh, for the further scenario, please. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask which would be the best place to find the current, uh, correct checklist that the examiners used, used. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> there is a myth 
there is a myth, there is a myth that every year the checklist changes. Checklist does not change every year. They will modify a few things here and there, but the basic, the core structure of the checklist is still the same. The basic principles of the checklist is still the same. I'll explain to you why. Like if it's a history taking station, right? You have to introduce yourself, right? It should be there in every checklist. You have to introduce yourself. You need to check, confirm the identity of the person you're talking to, the name, the date of birth. Then you need to ask them, how can I help you? Or some candidates use the phrase, what seems to be the problem? Or the other one is, what brings you to the emergency department? <clears throat> the way you talk, the way you ask that question will make all the difference, right? Your, now, now your voice, your tone needs to be soft. It needs to be reassuring. It doesn't need to be harsh. I know there might be candidates who just talk with a very high pitched voice, but they just have to modify the way they're going to speak up in the exam especially. Because uh, remember, this exam is very important because the examiners and the candidate and the patients are looking at you and assessing you out whether how good your communication skills stations are. I've already discussed this at the start, how important communication stations are. All right, so you could introduce yourself. You're going to ask the identity of the person you're talking to. You're going to ask one of the three phrases. I prefer asking what seems to be the, uh, what brings you to the emergency department, okay? Then the patient is going to give you a chief complaint. For example, I've got chest pain, I've got headache, I've got abdominal pain. Then you need to dig into that chief complaint. A, a candidate who does not dig into that chief complaint will lose points, right? Like what is about chest pain? You need to do Socrates, you need to ask about the where is it? When was, when was the onset of the chest pain? Intensity, can you describe me the intensity out of one to 10, with 10 being a very severe chest pain? Any aggravating factors, any relieving factors, okay? Have you had this before? Right, you have done chest pain. Put it to the side, okay. Then comes any associated symptoms. Along with the chest pain, have you got any other symptoms such as headache, nausea, vomiting? Patient might say, no. Okay, cut, finish. So introduction done, identity done, chief complaint done, associated symptoms done. Then comes your review of systems. That's where the marks are, the review of systems. In a sense, in, in importance, you have to ask from head to toe all the symptoms, right? The most important symptoms you need to ask. So how do we ask? I've seen candidates spend three minutes just on the review of systems. Remember, out of six minutes, if you spend three minutes on the review of systems, you're going to lose marks. You're going to lose mask on a mask on past medical history, surgical history, medication, allergies, travel history, social history, occupational history, marriage history, or alcohol, smoking. Uh, so you're going to lose mask on those, okay? mask, marks on those. Okay. So review of systems. How I do it, I will show you in the uh, scenario. So. The review of systems have certain chunk of marks. Then the past medical history, past surgical history, medication, allergies, travel history, in children's immunization history, in females, menstrual history, in gynae case, PV bleeding, that's a separate topic. So all of these carry certain marks. They carry one mark each, okay? So this is your checklist. In the end, you need to ask this, I normally use this phrase quite commonly, I used to use this phrase quite commonly, is there anything in the history that I might have missed that you might think is important? Please let me know. By doing this, I'm covering all my shortfalls. I mean, I might not have asked about shortness of breath. A patient might have added short of breath. So all of a sudden, the, the patient is duty bound to tell me he's got shortness of breath. And the examiner knows, hang on, this guy knows how to play Oski game, right? He's covering all his bases. I cannot not give him a marks for asking this question, right? You will have to get a mark, okay? Now, in the end, you need to make sure, you've asked this question, is there, have you got any specific concerns? 
Right, there we go. You've got one more tick for asking concerns, okay? Then you talk about, right, Mrs. Smith, I've taken the history from you. Just to summarize, you have this, your chest pain going on four days, it's sharp, so see with this. So I've, I've done a summary, okay? Is that correct? If you have missed, she will add a few points, okay? So another check is done. I think based on the history, I think these would be the top three differential diagnoses, but I would like to examine you in front of a chaperone because she's a female, okay? After examination, I would like to do some basic investigations such as full blood count, FPC, durian creatinine. Because you come in with chest pain, I think troponin is very important to be done here. ECG we need to do just to make sure your heart's okay. I would also like to do a chest X-ray just to make sure your heart shadow is okay, your lungs are fine, okay? Will that be okay with you? Right, so you finish off. One thing I forgot is, which uh, in, the, in the rhythm I forgot, if somebody complains of pain at the start, in the chief complaint, either it's chest pain, headache, abdominal pain, you have to all of a sudden ask, Mrs. Smith, I'm so sorry you were having chest pain. Would you like any painkillers? Right, there we go. The examiner knows, the candidate knows you are an excellent doctor because you are empathetic, you're caring, you want to look after the patient. Most of the, most of the times, the patient will say, no doctor, it's fine, okay? Uh, or if they say, yes, I would like some painkillers, then you can say, okay, Mrs. Smith, I would just ask, go and ask the nurse to give you some medications after I prescribe them. Is that okay with you? She would say yes, then you carry on. Now, if you follow this basic template, you shouldn't be able to fail. I mean, if you have good communication skills, you've done all the human factor things right, you are soft-spoken, your body language is nice, is not aggressive, your posture is soft, is a neutral posture, and you've done all the important questioning, you should pass the exam, right? It's as simple as this. Now, coming back to that question, do checklist changes every time? Yes, there will be slight modifications depending on who's making the exam, what, what is the theme of that exam, that session, or that, uh, I mean, spring or autumn, whatever the theme is. But all in all, 90% of the time, the checklist will be the same standard checklist, but you, you, you won't believe me, right? That checklist is with every candidate in the world, right? But they still don't pass the exam. Why don't they pass the exam? Because they're not focusing on the other things. They're not focusing on completing the checklist in a timely fashion with the good communication skills, right? You have to practice. Once you do this, you should be able to pass the exams, okay? Right. Okay, so, so we were supposed to take a 10 minute set break, but if you guys are okay to carry on, uh, we should just, I think we should just carry on. Uh, all right, we're just gonna carry on. If somebody wants to leave, they can leave, they can come back. It's up to them. It's a, it's a total scenario. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Yeah, Fuzzy, sure. I have one question. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Uh, suppose if the patient comes with chest pain or some kind of pain, if we forgot to offer the pain medication and initial introduction, um, so then later during the interview, if you offer the pain medication, are you still going to get the mark or is only we have to give an initial introduction? Okay. Thank you for that question, okay? So, it happens like it happened to me. I forgot to ask about the painkillers, but in the end, so when I talk about you finishing your history within five minutes as an, on an autopilot, what you gain is an extra one minute, okay? That one minute should be utilized by you for polishing off these things. Like for example, you haven't asked about the pain relief, then you go back, and, oh, I'm really sorry, Mrs. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Smith. Uh, I forgot to ask, but would you like some painkillers for your chest pain right now? It's absolutely fine to ask in the end, right? It's absolutely fine. This is a myth that the examiner won't give you a mark. Once you have in your allocated time, ask a certain question, the examiner is duty bound to mark you. 
Right, these, most of these sessions, especially in COVID scenario, might be recorded, okay? So if, some, if a candidate goes back and challenges this, this uh, uh, the marks afterwards, and they look out the recording and they say, oh, this, he asked a question about pain, even though afterwards, but he's not been given a mark. So you might get a mark. But most of the examiners, once you ask that question, even in the end, in your allocated time, you will get a mark. What you can't do is, what you can't do, once your seven minutes are up and the bell rings, you're going out of that station, but all of a sudden you remember, I haven't asked just pain. You turn around and say, Sorry, Mrs. Smith, can I just ask you for painkillers, uh, pain relief? Now that, you won't get a mark because the bell has rang. Your time is finished. Once your allocated time is finished, you finish. Anything you do afterwards doesn't count. You have to do before that. So it's absolutely fine to ask questions afterwards if you have forgot, okay? What? Hi, uh, Dr. Masood. Yeah. I have a question, I'm Dr. Prakash. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, sure, sure, please, Dr. Prakash. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when I, I gave the exam last time, uh, I got a patient with uh, uh, abdomen pain and I, I initially asked uh, the examiner, uh, the patient that do you have any pain, what's your pain score, and all I asked, and he told uh, this, is, this is what my pain and I gave the medicine. Uh, it's necessary to ask at the end of the station whether your pain is subsided. Um, you're talking about the that history station? No, it's an history station, yeah. A history section, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. You don't have to ask whether your pain is subsided, right? What you just have to mention is, if you have pain, would you like any painkillers? If yes, I will, I will go and describe and I will get the nurses to give you the painkillers, okay? Examiner might say, if, well, first you have to remember the role of the examiner, okay? I should have mentioned that before. I'll come to that answer. The examiner is there, is the examiner is there just to observe you, right? He's, he's not your friend, he is not your enemy. He's just there to observe you, how good or bad position you are, right? He will judge you on what you do on that day, but you have to make him be on your side. How you're gonna make him on your side is if you have the politeness or the mannerism, or the communication skills which are required for the exam, right? So examiner is there not to fail you, not to pass you. He will be only guided what you perform in that five to six minutes, right? That's what you need to understand. Now, as far as the checklist is concerned, it just, for the pain, it just asks, it just mentions, has the candidate offered analgesia. That's all. What it doesn't mention is, okay. did the candidate reassess the pain afterwards? No, okay. That might be true for examination stations or resuscitation stations if somebody has pain and you have given painkillers and you are there physically to examine the thing, but not necessarily required in history stations, okay? And I hope that is clear. I hope you okay, guys- thank you. You guys, I'm, no problem. I'm sure you guys know the role of examiner. I don't have to tell you. There is a misconception. Examiner is there to. Uh, there's, there's a myth. Uh, I hear it all the time. Oh, well, uh, I failed my exam because that, of that examiner. He didn't like me, right? Right. Well, there's a reason he didn't like you. He didn't like you because you might not have spoken softly. You might not have the human factors. You might not be sitting in the neutral position. You're not, you will be asking questions, but you might not be giving time for the patient to reply. The worst thing you can do is, and you guys will come across in psychiatry stations. I hope you don't, but sometimes they do. A psychiatry patient comes in, they just like to talk, okay? They're deliberately talking to, wasting, to waste your time. Okay, they don't want you to ask more questions. It's quite typical of certain psychiatry manic stations. If somebody's manic, they will just talk, 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 talk. They will move around the room. They will not allow you to ask questions. Now, how do we deal with this? Because it will be rude if you grab hold of the patient and make him sit down. It will be rude if you tell him, can you please stop? I need to ask certain questions, okay? 
So this is the skill. You need to ask, and you need to do, do this in a very subtle manner. When we're going to be doing our psychiatry stations, we're going to talk about the skill set which is required to tackle these problems, okay? Right. So all, what you don't want to do is, if, a candidate, if, if the patient is talking, 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 you rudely interrupt. If you rudely interrupt, you will lose a lot of marks. Previously, historically, uh, I know this for a fact, historically, uh, for example, a station has 30 marks, right? 20 marks were allocated to the checklist. Five marks were allocated to the examiner's impression of you. And five marks was allocated to the candidate and the patient's impression on you, okay? When I did my FR camp, that got redistributed. Then the 25 marks were given to the checklist and only five marks were given to the examiner. What the college did was took out the five marks of the perception of the patient because uh, there was objection that the patient might be biased for certain reasons, okay? Um, I'm not gonna disclose it right now because it's a public session, but so it's an open, clear playing field for every candidate. You go in, you do your checklist, you do your communication skills, you follow a set pattern. That's why I want to emphasize hard work, hard work, hard work, but hard work in the right way, in the right manner. You should have the mannerism of communication skills. Once you crack, once you nail the communication skills, trust me, every other station will be a walk in the park. You just have to not, then communication skills become a second nature, right? Then once you pass this OSCE, you will practice this in your clinical uh, field and that will transform you. So these exams are important exams, okay? Uh, I hope I've answered that question. If I have, uh, yeah. if somebody has any other question, please feel free because I'm actually enjoying the level of the questioning because these are very practical questions um, which candidates face, face every time. Uh, so, uh, so, so please, Dr. please Mishu? feel free, yes. Uh, Dr. Mashoud, uh, good evening. I am Dr. Baloj from Saudi Arabia, and uh, nice to meet you. And uh, uh, I would like to ask that, uh, as uh, according to the schedule you have sent, that today we are going to talk about the communication skill. So my request is that would it not be better to have uh, our queries regarding to the specific kind of uh, stations? Because as you said, that we have lots of queries in our mind, uh, right from the start, from the history and then examination and so forth. So uh, I would like to request uh, uh, that would it not be better to uh, ask about uh, specifically today uh, of, uh, about the communication stations. Oh, very, well, uh, very well pointed out, sir. Uh, all noted. What we're going to do is we're going to close this question and answer session now and we're going to move on. If you guys don't want any breaks, I'm happy to carry on. Uh, I'm going to carry on with my first scenario, if that's okay with you guys. Please carry on, sir. Okay, excellent. Yes, so, yeah, ready. So, so I have a patient here with me, right? Uh, so I will talk about this one. All right. I will read out the scenario to you guys. Then I will come go out. And then I will come in as a candidate. And I have a patient in front of me. She will be answering my questions. Her face for privacy reasons is uh, it doesn't matter if she, you see the face or not. But what's important is you see how I act, how I ask questions. Okay, then we will discuss about this after we've done it. We're going to do debrief. Okay, the scenario is I've already already mentioned that that I so I go in. Uh, I'm just going to read out. Read out. 55 year old. This is presented to the emergency department complaining of chest pain. She has past medical history of diabetes and hypertension. Vital signs are blood pressure 122 by 68, heart rate of 60, respiratory rate of 16, oxygen saturations of 99% on room air. Please take a history and discuss the manager, uh, management plan, okay? Uh, right. So as you can see, uh, I'm gonna be a bit more software techy from the next session, okay? So 
if you can see this pi from here all the way here, all the way here is history taking. So it's approximately, you will get sort of a picture like this in the station, which, which, which will show you the distribution of the marks. So the most of the marks in this station is history taking, which constitutes 70% of the marks, okay? 30% of the marks is for the management plan for the station, okay? So all of a sudden I'm clicking is a history station. Most of the marks are for history, okay? I'm gonna time myself. I'm gonna give myself at least five minutes. Okay, go out and come in, okay. Hello there, Mr. Smith. My name is Dr. Bushuba, the emergency medicine registrar. Can I just confirm your name, please? Yes, I can just confirm your date of birth. Yeah, yes, sure. Um, Mrs. Smith, can I just confirm, can, can just ask what brings you to the emergency department today? I'm sorry to hear that. Would you like any painkillers for your chest pain? Uh, sure. What I'll do, Mrs. Smith, is I will, uh, uh, once I finish this scenario, I will go and uh, prescribe some painkillers and the nurse will, uh, I'll make sure the nurse gives you the painkiller. Will that be okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, can I just ask a few questions about chest pain, if that's okay? Yes. Okay. Can you describe this chest pain? Is it sharp, dull, or is it burning in nature? Okay, and whereabouts is it? Does it go anywhere? Does it go to the right? Does it go to the left? Does it go to the back? Okay. And Ms. Smith, does, it make, does anything make it worse, such as breathing, moving? Does anything make it better, such as resting? Okay, all right, I understand. Uh, along with this chest pain, have you got any other symptoms associated with it? Sure, okay. Uh, now, um, I'm just gonna ask a few more questions. Ms. Smith, have you had any headaches? Okay. Any blurred vision? Any runny nose, sore throat? Okay. Any pain in your neck? Any swelling in your neck? Any shortness of breath? Any cough? Okay. Any abdominal pain or tummy pain? Okay. Do you feel sick or have you been sick? Sure. And are you opening your bowels okay? Yes. Okay. And are you putting some urine okay? Yes. Okay. Have you noticed any lumps or bumps anywhere? No. Okay. Have you noticed any weakness of the arms or the legs? No. Okay. That's fine. Um, just going to ask uh, a bit more questions about your past medical history, if that's okay. You just mentioned you've got diabetes and hypertension. Is there any other past medical history that uh, might be significant? No. Sure. And you take medication for these two? Yes. Okay. Um, have you had any surgeries done in the past? No. Okay. Are you allergic to any medications? No. Okay. Have you traveled abroad recently? No. Okay. And um, just going to ask a few personal questions. Uh, do you drink? No. Uh, do you smoke? No. Okay. And are you married? No. Okay. And what, uh, what work do you do? Okay. Um, so, Mrs. Smith, uh, what, I, what I could gather is from the history that you complained of chest pain, um, which is central, uh, which does not get worse with anything specific, and you've got a history of diabetes and hypertension. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. A uh, couple more questions about chest pain, if that's okay. Uh, can you describe the intensity of the pain out of 10, 1 to 10, 10 being a really severe pain? Six. Six. And what time did it come up, this chest pain? Sure. What time exactly? Nine o'clock. Okay. Uh, Ms. Smith, is there anything else in the history that I might have missed that you might think might be important? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any specific concerns you have apart from the chest pain? 
no problem at all, Ms. Smith. I'm just going to describe it and nurse, I'll make sure the nurse give it to you. Uh, uh, Ms. Smith, what I would like to do right now is I would like to examine you. I will get a female chaperone to be with me when I do my examination. Once I've done the examination, uh, I would like to do some investigations. These will include uh, full blood count, uh, looking at your hemoglobin levels, and looking for any infection. I will also look, like to look at your kidney function. I would also like to do a specific test for the heart, which is called troponin. I would also like to do an ECG, which essentially looks at the tracing of your heart. And I would like to do a chest X-ray to look at your lungs and heart shadow. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. If, if, if there any, I'll come with the nurse, examine you, and I'll make sure the nurse brings the medications with you for the pain. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Okay, right. So uh, I so I still have uh, I still have two minutes to go because I finish this session this questions history within five minutes. Okay, um, so in the last two minutes, I'm sitting there. Uh, I'm just going through my checklist again. Is there anything I th I might have missed? Like you might have remembered in the end, I did not ask the uh, the time of onset of the chest pain. Uh, and I did not ask the intensity of the chest pain. So I went back at the end and I finished off these two questions, which I thought were important, which I had missed earlier on. Um, now I have discussed the management plan with Mrs. Smith. I've told her I will come back and examine her with the chaperone and I will do FPC looking for the hemoglobin and in fact, kidney function to call the ECG chest X-ray. And then we'll come back and make a managerial plan, right? So what I did, uh, I'll, I'll tell you guys what I did, then I will open the floor to you guys. I went in pretending, or not pretending, you might have used the gel outside, so you have to just make sure you, you are rubbing your hands when you come in gently, okay? Um, then what all we, all we need to do is to do a very good introduction. Hello, Mr. Smith. My name is Dr. Kazi, one of the emergency medicine registrars. Okay. Um, so once you've done it, so the, your introduction should have your name, should have your title, your role. So that uh, if you're sitting for an MRKM exam, it's always safe to say I'm an emergency medicine registrar because that's what the level they're judging you at. If you are doing at the FRKM level, you, it's quite safe to say. Hi, my name is Dr. Kazi, I'm the emergency medicine consultant, okay? But if you don't want to do this specific title, some doctors have, they want to play safe. What they tend to do is, hi, uh, hi Mrs. Smith, my name is Dr. Mush uh, Dr. Kazi, one of the emergency medicine doctors, which is also fine, okay? But what you want to do is to take your name clearly and your designation the way you work. That should be clear, okay? Uh, now, First things first, once you enter, you need to make eye contact with the patient, okay? All throughout the history, you need to keep on making eye contact with the patient. This will tell the patient that you, you are confident and you, you know what you're doing. That would not be the time when you look down on the floor Look on the left side, look on the look towards the examiner. There's no point at all looking towards the examiner because the examiner is not going to help you in here. So it would be advisable if you guys can make eye contact with your patient. Now, your posture, your posture should be a neutral posture, right? Now, what you don't want to do is sit upright, okay? What you don't want to do is sit all the way forward. It needs to be somewhere in the middle, right? Okay. Now, I used to have a habit, I still have a habit of moving my arms everywhere when I talk, okay? Some of the candidates also do, that's, that's just, that's the way it is. But what you can do is, you need to grab hold of your hands somehow, okay? And put it on your thighs. So even if you have to ask questions, you just go one hand here and come back. One hand here, come back. What you don't want to do, your hands are flying all the way around, okay? 
Right. So we talked about the introduction. We talked about a neutral position. We talked about hand placement. We talked about eye contact. On the day of the exam, you need to dress appropriately. Now, wearing a tie is absolutely fine. Wearing a coat, you have to put the coat to the side. Wearing a tie is fine. Some, some candidates come with scrubs, which is absolutely fine. But remember, it's a professional exam. Whatever you're wearing, you need to make sure it's ironed out, it's neat and clean, and you have a name badge around. It could just be saying Dr. Mashur Kazi, emergency medicine. Okay, uh, you can you can get a name badge a name badge made anywhere outside. Okay, you don't have to put designation because the same uh, badge you can use in PLAP, you can use in MR chem, FR chem. You make a neutral badge. Dr. Mashur Kazi, emergency medicine. Okay, depending which exam you. So you need to have a clean scrubs, clean set of clothes, a name badge. You need to some. Uh, you need to have a stethoscope round it, make sure the end of the stethoscope are clean, you don't, it, it doesn't look dirty, okay? Because it's a professional exam, you are impressing yourself, uh, the candidate, the examiner, the patient needs to be impressed by your persona, your personality. It's not just about the personality, you need to have the skills to do that, but, it, but impression, human impression, physical impression also counts a lot, okay? Right, we talked about introduction, we talked about opening line, we talked about neutral position. Then what I did was, next thing I did was, I asked, I confirmed the identity of the patient, all right? I asked the name and I asked the date of birth, okay? Uh, what you don't want to do is just go in, I do, I'm Dr. Mashur, I'm the emergency medicine consultant. What brings you to the emergency department, right? You have skipped the identification of the patient, okay? There might be a tick mark. I'm not saying there must be. There might be a tick mark for checking the identity of the patient. Even if it's not there, it's a good practice that whoever you're consulting, even in daily practice, you confirm what the name and date of birth of that patient is, because what you don't want to do, take a history from a wrong patient, okay? If you start making this habit from now on, if you start introducing yourself appropriately, you start checking the identity of the patient, if you just make it a habit, it will help you in all the communication stations. It will help you in psychiatry, breaking bad news, history taking stations, okay? Then I focused on the chief complaint. Now, opening line, it's important. Some candidates do it differently. I normally tend to do is, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, what brings you to the emergency department, okay? Some candidates might do, Mrs. Smith, what seems to be the problem today? Okay, some candidates might do. Mrs. Smith, how can I help you? These are all fine. It's your personal preference, okay? It's, it's asking the same question. It's asking the question, what is the chief complaint, okay? But I just think it's nicer to say, Mrs. Smith, what brings you to the emergency department? The other thing is, if you have noticed that, uh, I don't know how am I coming across in the video, I'm trying to be, uh, very polite. I'm trying to ask questions in the clear words. I'm not using any complicated jargles. I'm just using simple English. Because my English is not my first language, that's absolutely fine. I mean, it's not a compulsory uh, criteria that English needs to be your first language to pass these exams. But what's important is you talk them in clear, simple words, okay? Because remember, that is the layman. That is the Patient who is a general public, he doesn't know your terminologies. So, I mean, yeah, we just need to be uh, <clears throat> a bit more realistic, okay, okay. I am going to say, what seems, Mrs. Smith, okay, the other thing is, you need to have a habit of asking the patient by the name, okay? Like if the scenario says, Jane comes to the emergency department, or uh, John comes to the emergency department, you need to start being in the habit of asking, so John, <clears throat> hi John, what's he, what brings you to the emergency department? Okay, uh, just, you know, first you need to start remembering the name, what they're using at the station outside. That's one thing you can memorize when you go into the station. So you start using that first name. If you start using the name, it just gives you a bit more rapport with the, uh, with the patient. Right, so I've identified this is a chest pain. 
then all of a sudden, autopilot, I go in and nail all the questions which come with chest pain, which is socketing, which could be the site of the chest pain, the onset of the chest pain, the intensity of the chest pain, the aggravating factors, the relieving factors of the chest pain. Like, so it doesn't matter whether it's chest pain, you can put just abdominal pain in that context and you will have to ask the same questions, the Socrates, the site, onset, intensity, radiating, aggravating factors, okay? Once you have to spend a couple of, uh, I mean, at least 30 seconds to a minute, fine tuning the chest pain, okay? After you're comfortable, you've asked all the questions about chest pain, you need to ask about associated symptoms. Is there anything else about the chest pain which is bothering you? Okay, they might say dizziness, then you need to ask a couple of questions about dizziness. What you don't want to do is dive into dizziness like you dived into chest pain. Remember, chest pain is the main complaint, not this dizziness. Dizziness is an associated symptom. So you can ask a couple of questions, they need to come out because there are loads of other questions you need to ask. So if you've done chest pain, you've done associated symptoms. Then comes the review of systems. Now there are two ways of tackling review of systems. Either you go system-wise, I mean, or you go from head to toe. I prefer, my personal preference is going from head to toe. And looking at the patient, I'm just saying, I'm starting from the head to toe. I'm just I see, seeing the head, I'm saying any headaches, any blurred vision, any ear pain, any nose pain, and then nasal discharge, any sore throat, any neck pain, any lumps or swelling in your neck. Okay, and I come to the respiratory, any shortness of breath, any cough, right? Then I come to the abdomen or gastrointestinal, any abdominal pain. Now, it's absolutely fine to ask the questions, um, are your bowels okay? Now, you can also ask, are you constipated? You're opening your bowels okay? Or you've got diarrhea? Instead of asking those questions, if you just ask one simple question, are your bowels okay? They're going to say, yes, it's okay. That means they don't have diarrhea, they don't have constipation, okay? Then you can ask urinary symptoms. Have you got any urinary symptoms, both in males or females? Okay, that's, it comes in genital urinary review systems, okay? Then, any weakness or pain in your arms or the legs, okay? Now, I ask this particular question, any lumps or bumps anywhere? <clears throat> the reason I ask this question, any lumps or bumps anywhere, that means I'm covering the skin. I mean, is there any swellings anywhere, any rash, things like that? So it's a, it's a, it's a way of asking a broader question in a short sentence, any lumps or bumps anywhere. Once I know I've done the review of system, then a couple of phrases you need to think about. The first one is, is there any specific concerns you have apart from the chest pain? I mean, it might come up, they might have a few things that you might have to think about, uh, but if it comes, uh, it's your lucky day because you've saved yourself, you've just gained a few extra marks. The other good phrase to put on, it's just my recommendations, whether you guys do it or not, it's totally up to you. I'm just recommending you, myself to you, is, um, so I've asked, and it's, it's very complete. Is there anything in the history that I might have missed that you think might be important? Please let me know. That is a way of me saying to the patient and the examiner, listen, I've done my best, but I'm sure I missed, if I miss something, this is the time to tell, please. And please give me your marks because I've covered everything right now. This is just a way of me covering up my loopholes. Listen, nobody can be perfect. If somebody says they're perfect in uh, I would like to meet them. I mean, uh, every, it's a stressful environment, especially in Nosky. It's a high adrenaline exam. It's a high stakes exam because it's a life-changing exam. Your family is dependent on it. Your career is depending on it. Your promotion is depending on it. Lots of pressures on it, okay? So nobody's perfect, but you need to find phrases or things which will make sure you cover those spaces. Okay, then comes to the, the, the main bit. 
you've just done the history, right? You cannot make a diagnosis just on the history. So you ask the patient, um, I would also like to examine you with a chaperone, with a female chaperone. Will that be okay with you? Okay, all right. She will say, yes, it's fine. Obviously, you're not going to examine then. You, you just say to examine, I would like to examine. Then you would like to do some investigations, right? Simple things, FPC, full blood count. Why am I doing full blood count? I normally do it for two things. Infection, WBC, and hemoglobin. I mean, I'm not concerned about lymphocytes, erythrocytes, neutrophils. I just want to look at WBC and hemoglobin for the full blood count, okay? And I don't want to waste my critical time explaining the other intricacies of the full blood count. I don't have time. Time is gold in OSCE. I want to save every second. Full blood count. I just want to check your hemoglobin and your WBC count for infection. I also want to do some kidney function tests because that's in, in, it's a standard test you do in the, in the chest. Chest pain, cardiac. I would like to do troponin, heart enzyme. Okay. Uh, ECG and a chest X-ray. ECG to look at the tracing of the heart. Chest X-ray to look at the heart and the lung shadows, or heart and the lungs. Because I think these are the only things you need to really be concerned about: just the pneumothorax, pleural effusions, cardiac, cardiomegaly. Okay. This is not the time or place to show off your medical knowledge. The chest X-ray is looked is there for ten different things. I would like to do ten different. No, 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 no. Let's not go into those. You need to be specific. It's a targeted operation. You need to have your uh, targets in front of you and just go and bang, 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 bang. Okay, right, then comes. So I've done uh, closing remarks, concerns, anything in the history. I've done, I wanted to examination. I've talked about the investigations. The thing I did not mention in this scenario is differential diagnosis, okay? Well, Mrs. Smith, I think it could be one of these things. First of all, I want to make sure it's nothing to do with the heart. Hence, I need to wait for the ECG and troponin to come back. Other things could be muscular, it could be gastric, okay? But those are things which I will not be more concerned about. What things I'm more concerned about is just to make sure uh, you, you're not having any cardiac problems. I know it's not a PE most likely because it's not a periodic chest pain. There's nothing which makes it worse or better. So I've already excluded PE based on my history, okay? So when you give a list of differential diagnoses, the, the most high stake differential diagnosis comes first. The most important differential diagnosis to rule out in this patient is cardiac because she's 55, she's a diabetic, hypertensive, she's coming with an atypical chest pain. So that's where the goal is. That's where if you go in and say, I want to look for musculoskeletal, costochondritis, gastritis, and you don't mention about cardiac, it's it, probably will be fair for the examiner not to pass you, okay? Because this station is to make sure you know this patient is a risk factor for cardiac disease. I hope that's clear. Uh, I think I've covered most of the things, but I would like to take questions and discuss further on. So please feel free to ask questions. Hi, Doc. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, when you introduce, do we have to ask the date of birth? Or simply you can ask, how old are you? Like, Miss Smith, what's your name and how old are you? Is that fine? Or do you have to ask exactly the date of birth? And the second question is, <clears throat> do we have to request the chaperone even for history stations apart from examination stations? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Very good questions, OK? <clears throat> now. Uh, introduction is your own preference. You can choose any of the three uh, scenarios I mentioned. Uh, identification, okay? As long as you do some sort of identification, that's okay. As long as you just confirm the name of the patient, that's absolutely fine. If you just want to confirm name and date of birth, that's fine. If you want to confirm name and age, that's absolutely fine as well. But I prefer candidates asking name and date of birth, okay? Because you can't ask the MRN or medical record number, because that's not going to be there. There could be a couple of patients with the same surname or same name. 
So hence data board becomes important. It's just my way of polishing off the finished article. <clears throat> now it would come down to each candidate's personal preference, whether they're comfortable just asking the name or date of birth. But just my personal preference would be name and date of birth. Okay. The second question, it's not necessary to have a chaperone in a history taking station unless you suspect there's something else going on here. Okay. As a whole, as a standard, you can take a history from a female, if you are a male, without a chaperone. But for examination of a female, it's compulsory. Okay. Um, and for certain examinations in the, in the male, you need to have a chaperone, such as a PR exam, okay, or looking at the genitalia. So you need, even if you're doing a male examination of those, you should get a chaperone, or at least ask for a chaperone, whether they provide you or not, it's different, okay? So, introduction, personal preference, I prefer name and date of birth. Not necessary to have a chaperone in taking history, but compulsory to have a chaperone when you examine a female patient, okay? I hope that answers the question. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Sir, I uh, have a question. Yes, yes, go ahead. May I? Yeah. The first one is, do we have to take sexual history in every history taking sex, uh, se uh, this station? And uh, my second question is, while uh, explaining the differentials, do we have to, uh, can we just say that, yes, I will rule out the cardiac thing, then I will rule out the gastro thing, or we have to specifically mention that I will rule out MI, pericarditis, or gastritis, or eso uh, this uh, esophageal rupture? Do we have to do like this? Uh, good question, excellent question, right. <clears throat> Sexual history is not important to be asked in every, in every station, right? Sexual history is for specific histories, such as in a male patient, if they come with hematuria, I mean, you need to ask the sexual history because it could be STDs, sexually transmitted disease, okay? Uh, if it's, uh, so what I, in, in the way what I covered in this station about sexual history is, I asked about her marital status, okay? So she said she's divorced. She could have said she's married, if she would have said no, I'm, I'm, I'm married, okay? Sexual history becomes really important in male patients with hematuria, any patient with joint pains, okay? Especially if they're young. In females with vaginal bleeding, sexual history becomes important. So to answer this question, does sexual history need to be asked in every history? No, it's depending on the, uh, the, the, the history you're taking. I mean, in chest pain, Asking a sexual history would just look odd. Uh, I mean, it would just look odd. Uh, uh, I mean, in headache, you can ask a sexual history because you can have sub, uh, subdural hemorrhage, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, when you have sexual activity, uh, vigorous sexual activity, sudden onset of uh, headache while you're having sexual activity, they, they, that headache becomes important. But in chest pain, I just thought it would look odd. The way I wanted to cover this by asking the marital status, okay? Now, the differential diagnosis, okay? Important question. Uh, when you're giving a list of differential diagnoses, uh, you need to make sure your first two, or the first one, focuses on uh, the most important differential diagnosis which the examiner of the college is asking you in that station. In my station, which I did, it's the cardiac because she's coming with chest pain. She's coming with all the risk factors. So for me, cardiac becomes top. The way I'm gonna rule this out is, A, if the patient's having chest pain more than six to eight hours, then a troponin, standalone troponin will be important will be enough to rule it out. But if the patient has just had a chest pain half an hour ago, she's got all the risk factors and she's still in chest pain, I cannot rule out a cardiac disease unless I do one to pull in now and then pull in afterwards, three, four hours, depending on which activity you're working at, okay? So ruling out the most important differential diagnosis is important. Coming back to the other two or three, second or third differential diagnosis, 
one can never rule out a gastritis unless you do an endoscopy. Okay, so you cannot rule out a costochondritis unless you do CT or MRI. Even that's, I mean, sensitivity of that is uh, debatable. So the only thing you need to rule out is does this patient have an immediate, imminent cardiac problem that I need to deal with right now? And that will depend the time when the chest pain started. Is she still having chest pain? Is she a high risk depending on heart scoring or kidney scoring? Okay. You need to have the scoring in the back of your mind, or you don't have to disclose that scoring to the candidate. Uh, but you need to know that you're making those decisions based on certain risk stratifications, such as TB scoring or heart scoring. Okay. And no, it's not important to rule every diagnosis out. The only thing which is important to rule out is the most, the first most important diagnosis that you think the examiner or the question is all about. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free. Dr. Mashud, so yes. as you said that we need to uh, at least uh, talk about uh, initial two important or I could say also life-threatening causes in the differential diagnosis. But as you said that uh, we should talk about that I need to rule out cardiac cause. So I should not use the terminology like myocardial infarction or the acute coronary syndrome. Am I right? That's correct. Unless you have an ECG in front of you, which is the ST segment elevation, or you have an ECG in front of you, which the examiner just presents to you, which is ischemic, or it's mentioned in this scenario outside the station that this ECG is ischemic with new ECG changes, ST depressions, TVA, flip TVAs, okay? Then it becomes ischemia. Then you have to explain to the patient, listen, your uh, Mrs. Smith, your ECG doesn't look right. It has some changes, which makes me highly suspicious that your, um, you might be having a heart attack, okay? But in this case, I don't have any hard facts that this patient is suffering from an imminent cardiac problems. I can rule them out, uh, and you need to use your wording a bit subtle. Uh, I mean, if you say to the patient, I want to rule out a myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome, uh, because the patient is a layman or general public, they might turn around and say, uh, Dr. Kazi, what do you think by acute myocardial infarction? Then I might have to say, I'm sorry to say that, Mr. Smith, uh, what I meant was, I want to rule out any heart problems. I mean, just in simple words, okay? Uh, but that will change if you, uh, if it's a teaching session and if you have a ischemic looking ECG and you have to teach the ECG uh, to your uh, junior doctor or a medical student, then you can use your medical terminologies, acute chest, coronary syndrome, ST depression, and STEMI, and you know, all those things. But I prefer not to use medical terminologies in front of communication stations, in front of a patient, okay? Um, any other questions before we move on to uh, the other? Uh, yes, Dr. Mashud, I have a question about uh, painkillers. Do we have to mention which kind of painkiller we want the patient, uh, we want the nurse to give to the patient, or we can just say painkiller? Uh, not necessarily. What you can do is, uh, you can say to the patient, Mrs. Smith, uh, I'm really sorry to hear you in your complaint of chest pain. Have you taken any painkillers up to now? She might, say, they might have said, yes, I've just taken paracetamol two hours ago. Then you might say, would you like some more painkillers? I can give you some different painkillers. If not, it's absolutely not necessary to name the specific painkillers in the communication station. You might have to name the painkillers in the resuscitation station or the name of the medications in the resuscitation examination scenario, but certainly not in uh, communication stations where your focus is just to give some analgesia to the patient so as to make them a bit more comfortable. It's certainly not necessary. No, no, I, I wouldn't uh, name specific pain. But what I can just ask is, have you taken any painkillers? If not, uh, I, I will more than happy to provide you with the painkillers, okay? Uh, I, ho I hope Thank that you answers for that. No, no, yes, no. definitely. I have a question about chaperone. Uh, so if a female doctor is uh, going to examine a male patient and she is offering a chaperone, what has to be the gender of the chaperone? 
Okay. Uh, sorry. The if patient I, is male and the doctor is female. Yes. May, okay. Good question. It's a patient. It's a doc, um, Patient is male and the female patient. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So, uh, I would go for a male chaperone. Okay. Just because the patient would be more comfortable, the same gender of what the patient is. I, if you look at me, if a female doctor comes and examines me, I would rather have a male standing next to me as a chaperone than another female standing next to me, just me. Uh, so I'm just putting myself in a patient's uh, place. So I would prefer a same gender chaperone. Uh, doctor's gender doesn't matter. I think the patient's gender matters a lot. Okay. Um, any other questions? Sir, I have a question, uh, like for all the uh, scoring system, like we have to see the mini mental state or the Timmy score. So do we have to calculate that in our mind or we need to um, tell the scores and everything to the patient as well? Or no, we need to do it in our heads, in our own heads. Oh, good, 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 good. Excellent practical question. Now, if it's a communication station, just like I did now, chest pain, you are calculating the Timmy and the heart score in your mind. You don't have to tell the patient, certainly not tell the patient because they will get confused. If they, ask, they start asking you questions, well, doctor, why do you think you need to rule out a heart problem? Uh, then you can say, well, Mrs. Smith, uh, in, the, in the emergency medicine, we use certain scoring systems, such as the heart score. And based on that scoring system, you are uh, in the moderate category or severe category. Hence, uh, I will have to rule out uh, a cardiac uh, heart problems. Uh, only if they ask, if uh, there's always a possibility that the patient might ask, start asking questions, well, Dr. Kazi, why do you think it's a cardiac problem? Then you can say, based on this risk stratification, uh, I, I think, there, but uh, initially, when you say this to the uh, patient, I need to rule out cardiac problems, you don't have to mention the scoring system at all, okay? Uh, any other questions? Dr. Mishus, regarding the medication history, uh, I mean, can we ask just any regular prescribed medications you are on, or we have to ask specific like aspirin, clopidogrel, or painkillers uh, pain or antibiotics? Okay, good question. So in, in a general scenario, uh, just the name of the medications, if you, if you uh, well, what you could say is, um, well, Ms. Uh, Smith, are you on any medications? She would say yes. Uh, do you know the names of the medication? Most likely she will say no, but they are from the blood pressure and hypertension. That's okay. But in specific histories, such as, uh, I mean, GI bleeding, I mean, hemoptysis, hematemesis, uh, PR bleeding, I mean, petechial rashes, meningitis, uh, you will have to ask, are you on any specific blood thinning medications, such as, Aspirin, clopidogrel, warfarin, uh, debicatrin, uh, or do you know the name of the medication you are? So that would be a bit more history specific uh, when you ask probing into the medication names. But if it's a general um, history scenario, uh, th th there's no real indication to ask the specific name of the medications. As long as you ask the patient, are you on any medications? Do you know the name of the medication? No. Are those for blood pressure and diabetes? Yes. Okay, that's more than enough. The tick is there. What you're more concerned about is you need to get the ticks. You need to get the ticks. You need to get the ticks because ticks is what will determine whether you pass the exam or not. Okay. Uh, and all these small things uh, make up the package that will pass you not one single thing will make you pass this exam. Even if you've done the best checklist in the world, but you don't have the mannerism, you're not soft-spoken, you haven't asked the concerns, you haven't made the patient comfortable, but you have ticked all the checklists. Examiner will find a way because all of a sudden he says, no, I don't think he's fit for practice right now. He might have to come back and do this exam again. So uh, it's a whole, a small, small things combined together Get you success. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Um, what we'll do is, uh, if you have no further questions, uh, we can go on to the next scenario.
which we're going to make it a bit shorter because uh, I know you guys, uh, most of you have just taken two hours off for this session because we mentioned it's just two hours. So we need to make sure we get everything done in, in, in these two hours. Obviously, what, uh, OSCE is like a Pandora box, right? And you can well imagine we're just doing one basic history and we have so many questions to ask. But those are important questions. None of the questions which are asked today is irrelevant. Those are all important questions. And I'm sure that tens and hundreds of other questions you guys have for this chess pin, important simple history scenario that you want to ask, but uh, be a bit limited for the time. Hopefully, I'm hoping uh, we're going to do a few more sessions like this. So by the time you are starting to starting to prepare for your exam, uh, some people want to do it in January, some people in March, June, that's okay. But what you want to do is you know what's required from you. Now it's absolutely fine to have uh, to go and speak to different uh, examiners or people who do OSCE scenarios, it's absolutely fine. What that will do is that will give you flavor how different people do the OSCEs. Then you can sit down and say, oh, uh, Dr. Kazi did this, he mentioned this, I like this point. But Dr. X did this, I like this point. And Dr. Y did this, I like this point. So at the end, you combine all the good points. But what you don't want to do is uh, mix all the points together and in the end, the dish gets spoiled. I mean, too many cooks spoil the dish, okay? So you need to just pick up the good points and then make sure you're following the template and, uh, and just make sure you do the right things. Okay, I hope you, uh, I'm giving you an analogy. I hope that goes well. So if no questions, we're gonna move on to the next station, if that's okay. Yes, sir, you can move. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm just trying to find out what I'm gonna see this, okay. Okay, I'm just going to read out the scenario. Uh, <clears throat> you are the team leader, the scenario I've already discussed briefly. You are the team leader in the cardiac arrest when a 70 year old male patient was brought to the emergency department after sustaining a pre hospital cardiac arrest following a complaint of central crushing chest pain. Patient had a previous history of myocardial infarction and hypertension. Paramedics started CPR, which was continued in the emergency department. Patient has unfortunately passed away. Please discuss this case with the daughter who has just arrived. <clears throat> so 10 minutes, 10 seconds. I've read this. I'm thinking, oh, this is the breaking bad news station. All right, so template comes in front of me. All right, okay. I'm gonna read again for 10 seconds and make sure I pick up the finite details. So this is a 70 year old patient. Name of the patient is not given, important. Most of the time it might be given, this scenario is not given. Oh, he sustained cardiac arrest pre-hospital, okay. He's got risk factors, myocardial infarction, hypertension, okay. So he's already, I, most, I think most likely he had a cardiac arrest, okay, because of primary cardiac problems. This is what I need to tell the doctor, okay, excellent. Just waiting for the uh, bell to ring, then I'm gonna go in, okay. Someone's mic is on. Could you please mute it? I'm going to mute, you, uh, mute everyone so they can listen to me. And I'm going to set my clock, okay? The timer. So we know exactly how much time we need to finish. <coughs> Uh, by the way, just to, uh, just to re retaliate, these stations last between six to seven minutes, okay? Now, I have done a lot of practice, so I can finish them in five minutes, okay? At my peak, when I was giving MRKM, FRKM, I was definitely finishing everything within four and a half, five minutes, okay? And I was spending last minute 
just fine tuning the last things and hearing what's happening in the next station because I was preparing myself for the next week because the stations are next to each other. But some, pay, some candidates, when we're starting off the practice now, will take at least seven to eight minutes, but that's fine. That's absolutely fine, nothing to worry about. You will need practice and hard work to cut your time. Ideal time is anywhere between five and a half to six minutes when you back everything up. Okay, and whatever time you get bonus, left out is bonus, but you should be aiming. Uh, if you do it within eight minutes initially, that's absolutely fine, okay? But if you can make it five and a half, six minutes at your peak, just a week before your exam, that would be an ideal scenario, okay. Can I just confirm your name, please? Yes. Samantha. Uh, can you just confirm your relative's name you're here for? Yes, Mrs. Mrs. Beck. Okay. Um, Samantha, ideally, I would like to have this discussion with you in a private room with a, uh, with a female chaperone with me. Uh, I can ask one of my senior sisters to come with me if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, Ms. Samantha, I can just confirm, I can just ask how much do you know what happened to Mr. Smith today? I don't know, I just received the call from the Okay, all right. Um, is there anything else you know what happened to Mr. Smith today? No, 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 I was hoping that was fine. Okay. Um, Samantha, what happened was, uh, I'm the emergency medicine registrar. Uh, I was working uh, in research station area today. We received a call approximately half an hour ago that the paramedics were bringing in a 70 year old male patient uh, who was in cardiac arrest. Uh, what information we had that Mr. Smith was complaining of chest pain, then his heart stopped and the paramedics started what, they, what we normally call CPR or chest compressions or resuscitation. They gave him a lot of medications and by the time Mr. Smith arrived at the department, we carried on the resuscitation. Uh, uh, Ms. Samantha, what I was trying to say is, um, once we carried on the resuscitation, we gave him a lot of medications, but unfortunately, uh, he did not recover. Ms. Smith, I'm really sorry to say, but uh, Samantha, I'm really sorry to say, but Mr. Smith has passed away. Mm. I understand. But let me assure you, we did everything what we could. Sure. Um, before we before we take you to see Mr. Smith, is there anybody else you would like us to call, or would you like anybody else to be here? Any relatives? I do understand, Smith and Samantha, that this uh, uh, has all information how all come all of a sudden. Uh, I'm really, all, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, but if you want, we can ring Harry up and we can give him a call, and then we can discuss further on if you have any questions. Sure. What, what we'll do is, Samantha, uh, we're going to clean things up and we're going to take Mr. Smith to a private room. We, we will get you there so you can spend some private time with Mr. Smith. Is that okay? Yes, sure. sure. I'll just go ahead and speak to the nurses. Before we do that, can I just ask a couple more questions if that's okay with you? Yes. Can I just ask, was Mr. Smith a religious person? No, okay. Uh, the reason I was asking was because we do, the hospital has priests available. So if uh, if you want, you can get the priest around and they, he can do the last rituals. Sure, no, I understand. 
Uh, and did Mr. Smith ever mention about organ donation? No. Sure. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just give you a leaflet which, get, which has information about organ donation. You can read over it when you have time, or you can discuss with your family and get back to us. I'm on the shift till eight o'clock in the evening, uh, and the other senior nurses are also available. If you have any questions, or if any relative comes and they have any questions, please feel free to contact us and we will answer all the questions. So what I'll do is, uh, I'll go around, make sure things are tidied up, and we'll take Mr. Smith to one private room. Then we're going to call you to go into the room and you can spend some private time there. Is that okay? Yes, sure. I'm really sorry about uh, the loss you lost today, but if there are any questions, please feel to call us, okay? All right. Thank you very much, Louise. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, breaking bad news is always a tricky station for a couple of reasons, okay? Um, you never know what you're gonna expect from, uh, you never know what you're gonna expect from the, uh, the patient. Sometimes they will take the news okay, uh, sometimes they won't accept the news. Uh, and most of the time, and sometimes they will start making a lot of fuss, then you have to go into uh, difficult consultation mode as well. So you, along with the breaking bad news, then the difficult consultation comes up. The key points is you need to do the setting. What I mean by setting is, once you go in, you need to make sure you ask for a private room and a female chaperone to be with you. Okay, a big female because she was a female. If it was a male, I would have asked for a male chaperone. Ideally, it could be one of the team members which was involved in the cardiac arrest. It could be a senior sister or any of the AD sisters or nurses who were there. So setting the scene right is the right term to use. It should be privacy and there should be a chaperone. Some candidates prefer that I would like to switch off my plea so that I don't take any calls and the, and the nursing staff know where I am if there is any emergency. So you can add on the plea if you think that's appropriate. Then you introduce yourself as you always do uh, in any communication station. You would say, hi there, my name is Dr. Mashoud, one of the emergency medicine registrar for MCAM, consultant for FRCAM. Then you, you confirm the identity of the person you're talking to, like it was Samantha. And in this case, you have to confirm the name of the patient you're dealing with. Then, it would be a good idea, before you start off telling the whole history about what happened, it would be a good way of asking, what do you know, or how much do you know what has happened to Mr. Smith today? It will give you a couple of advantages. First of all, it will help you understand how much the other person knows. So when you start giving the information, you don't duplicate that information and waste your time, okay? The second thing is, you will know how much they're aware about where the sessions going. You will have a feeling if they know everything, that means they will ask you a bit more probing questions. If they know very little, they probably won't ask many questions because they will just rely on the information you're going to give. So once you establish what, you, what the other person knows, you're going to carry on from forward, from, from the the way forward from the way they don't know. So you, are, so you don't end up duplicating the things. And you need to be very short, to the point, and you don't have to, once it's going, it start going into the details, that's where they might ask you a lot of probing questions. Or, and if they ask you probing questions, you will be duty bound to answer those questions then uh, you're just going to eat into your time allocated. So you have to keep it very simple. You start off from the information that the other person doesn't have. And then you have to give some sort of a warning shot. The warning shot could be, uh, uh, I mean, we tried everything, we did resuscitation, we gave multiple medications, we were doing chest compressions, but unfortunately, it wasn't successful, okay? For me, that's a warning shot, that things haven't gone right. 
So I haven't clearly broken the bad news that look, Mr. Smith is dead or he's passed away. I've just given a warning shot. Ideally, you should give some silence after the warning shot. So you give the warning shot, the other person knows there's some bad news coming their way. You're given slight silence for five seconds, at the, 10 seconds at the maximum, five seconds more than enough. Then you go on and say, I'm really sorry to say a Mr. Smith has passed away. Or I'm really sorry to say that Mr. Smith is dead. The passed away for me is a bit more okay. Um, so I, I just go and say, I'm really sorry to say but Mr. Smith has passed away. Okay. So you've broken the bad news. Now it could go two ways. Either the other person sitting there will accept this news and say, oh, I just spoke to him this morning. I'm so sorry, how could he do that? Or this is normally a general reaction. But sometimes they might say, oh, you're lying. You it can't be like this. But then you have to calm them down and use your tactics, which you would normally do in a difficult consultation. We can talk about later on. All right, so you have given the warning shot, silence, you've broken the bad news, you've given silence. Then, then comes the stage when you offer support to the person. Support could be of different forms. You can ask them, would you like any other family members to be here with you? There might be family members waiting in the car park. There might be family members waiting in the waiting room. Then it would be a good opportunity to ask them to come in to be with the patient, to be with the, uh, uh, with the relative. Or if there's nobody around, you can say, is there anybody we can call and uh, who you would like to come to be with you? You can say, oh, uh, you can call them, you can offer them. Okay, that's no problem. What we'll do is we will call them and we'll ask them to come to the hospital. That's okay with you. So you've offered some support to her. You've also offered the support that I'm here in the shift till 8 p.m., for example, and the nurse is here till the shift till 8 p.m. If you have any questions or concerns, or if any relative comes, if they have any questions or concerns, they can come and speak to me or the nurse and we'll be more than willing to answer all the questions and concerns, okay? This offering support. Now, there are a couple of important things you need to think about, you need to take. One is religious views. Uh, it wouldn't be wrong just to ask, can you just ask if Mr. Smith was a religious person? The reason I'm asking is, uh, if it's a Christian person, there's priest around the hospital. If it's a Muslim, there's an imam available in the hospital who can do the um, last blessings they want. Uh, but if they're not a religious person, that's okay. You just leave it there and you carry on. The next important question is organ donation. Uh, there might be that the person who's passed away has expressed views about organ donation. If they have expressed views about organ donation, you can say to them, well, what we can do is we can get in touch with the our organ donation team and they will come and have a chat with you about what the next steps are. So that polishes off your organ donation. If they haven't discussed about organ donation or the patient or the person who's passed away hasn't expressed any views, then you can say, what I will do is I will offer you a leaflet about organ donation. You can read through it. If you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch with us. We'll be more than happy to help you out. Okay, so polished off that. Tick done. Religious organ donation done. Offer support done. Written bad news done. Warning shot done. Information summarized. Thank you. Then comes, it would be a nice idea to say, would you like to see the patient? Well, my, my patient, my candidate, the mama, my participant just said, yes, I would like to see him. But sometimes you don't see it straight away. Then you offer them, would you like to spend some time with Mr. Smith or would you like to see Mr. Smith? They would say, yes. They would say, okay, what we'll do is we'll clean up the things, we'll tidy up the things, and we will move Mr. Smith to a private room where you can have some private time with Mr. Smith. Okay, that just makes, uh, tells the examiner, tells the patient or the person you're talking to that you are very compassionate, passionate, and you know, you're empathetic, you, uh, you know the workings or the surroundings of the system you're working with, okay? So that would be a good idea. Then you again express uh, your apologies, and I'm really sorry to uh, 
Uh, I'm really sorry about your loss. Uh, remember, this is a station where your tone needs to be at a lower level, okay? Because somebody has just lost a very loved one. So you need to express that you know their feelings. Uh, it, it's just human nature. If you, in, in also real life, if some, if you're, uh, God forbid, if your relative or friends pass away, you talk to them in a very polite manner. You talk to them softly. Same scenario over here. You can talk to them very softly, but clearly. Uh, you don't have to go so soft that the other person doesn't hear you. But you don't have to go that loud that it just, uh, it's not giving you good vibes. So you need to find it. That will come with practice. That's where practice comes into play. So in the end, you're going to tell about the availability, that you are available. Uh, I've got, I'm carrying a bleed, you can call the visas, they will call me and I'll come and speak to you anytime, okay? Oh. Any other, is there anything else I would like to do, okay? So that's the end of the Breaking Bad News. Now there will be questions and let's uh, take questions and do one by one, okay? First question, if it's, uh, anybody has questions. Hello, sir. Dr. McKenzie here. Um, for the use of the word, can you use that on the egg? Some or no? The second question is, I believe you asked for the relative early on. Is the relative permitted to be a chaperone or no? Sorry, Dr. McKenzie, I didn't catch your first question. For the use of the word passed away, can you use that on the exam or no? Okay, good. Very good questions. Uh, so you can use, it's better to use, uh, the, uh, it's better to use the phrase, Mr. Smith has died because that will leave no confusion as to patient is no more. I'm really sorry to say, but Mr. Smith has died. The reason I was using passed away is, uh, sometimes I just stutter when I say died. Um, when I was doing exams, I was really good, but now uh, I'm getting old. But the best word would be, I'm really sorry to say, Mr. Smith has died. Okay, the second question, the second answer, the relative should not be used as a chaperone. Uh, chaperone should be somebody uh, who has witnessed, uh, in this uh, Breaking Bad News scenario, is somebody who has witnessed what has happened and ideally should be from a medical fraternity. Could be a nurse, could be a junior doctor, uh, could be a doctor from other speciality. Uh, somebody who's involved in this case, okay, who can uh, uh, be there to answer any difficult questions. In, I'm talking about real life. You can answer any difficult questions if it does arise. But it would be good practice to have uh, a medical person as a chaperone, but not a relative, and use the word, unfortunately, Mr. Smith has died, as opposed to passed away. I should not have used passed away, but... Uh, you're right to correct, it should be died. They should leave no confusion to the person you're talking to that there's hope, there's a chance, the patient's died, full stop, okay? I hope that answers. Can we have the next questions? Dr. Mishu, the, yeah. the, if we get the other scenario, like if the patient comes with the intracranial bleed and the GCS is three, so how can we, uh, or what uh, statement can be used that the patient is going to die. Good, good question. Can I just uh, take your name, uh, please? My name, Dr. Mushu? Yes, yes, please. I'm Dr. Baloch. Thank you, Dr. Baloch. Uh, Dr. Baloch, the very good question. Now, that scenario, would, uh, it, I wouldn't say that would be tricky. That would be, again, a very straightforward scenario. The question is, patients got a GCS of three and it's got a big intracranial bleed. You will not be the only person making that decision, okay? That the patient will be uh, left alone and no in invasive intervention will be done. I hope you will be discussing this case with your surgery, who has seen the CT scan images and they say, they, in their expert opinion, the bleed is so catastrophic that it's not life uh, saving. Okay, so you will, you will mention it to the relative that you have discussed the CT scan 
findings with the neurosurgeons who are the experts in the bleeding in the brain and in their expert opinion the bleed is so catastrophic that the chances of survival are minimal okay right in this case gcs3 i hope you will also discuss with critical care and icu so you can also uh, say the sentence uh, We've also discussed this case with our intensive care team or the ICU. And in their expert opinion, patient is not a candidate for critical care because the bleed is so catastrophic that it's unsurvivable. Okay. So what you've done is you've taken the onus from you that I'm not the one making that decision. I have done my duty of care. I've discussed with all the appropriate teams. I've discussed with neurosurgeons who are the experts uh, in dealing with bleeding in the brain. If the thing is salvageable, they will take him to the theater. If the thing is unsurvivable, they will not do anything. In this case, the thing is unsurvivable. You will have to use those words, unsurvivable, catastrophic bleed in their expert opinion, okay? And then you, with the low GCS, you will have to discuss with critical care. And in their expert opinion, this patient is not a candidate for ICU because he will not survive ICU stay because of this unsurvivable intracranial bleed. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, not do any invasive you know, procedures. Uh, we will make sure Mr. Smith is comfortable. We will keep him comfortable. We will get a palliative team around uh, and we will make sure he's in pain free. Uh, and he passes away uh, comfortably. Uh, and if you want, you can uh, be with Mr. Smith as much as you want, for as long as you want. We will provide a private room for you and your family if you want, okay? Um, I, I, and those scenarios, I hope I get a chance to do it with you guys. Uh, those are very common scenarios. The reason I picked a very straightforward cardiac arrest scenario is I didn't want it to complicate things on the first session. We will, once we build the blocks, once we build the template up, we will ramp up the intensity of the exams, okay? If I had just given you this scenario, GCS3, not for salvageable, the patient family comes and says, no, I want every treatment to be done, okay? Now that becomes a bit tricky. What I expect you guys to do is to slowly build up your tempo. Session for today is to focus on the basics of communication skills. Okay, I'm hoping I will get to do more sessions with you. And when I do those sessions, we will ramp up the intensity and we will expect what we'll do next time we could do short sessions. So we'll get each of the candidates to do a station and uh, then we will pick you up, pick up your mistakes. This would be the time to pick mistakes from the candidates. Uh, I don't have any personal grudges against anyone. You're all lovely people, but we have to pick mistakes up right now. Better for the mistakes to be picked up right now. Those mistakes identified, amended, solved. You go back to your stations. You don't repeat those mistakes again. Rather than you making those repeated mistakes in the exam, because you will have no chance to come back from the exam. You will have to wait six months again. And then you have to have other mental stress, pressures, family, financial, career pressures, a lot of pressures, okay? So we'll do, we'll ramp up the intensity. But what we'll do is, if there are any questions about the basics of uh, breaking bad news, we can discuss right now. Yeah, and Dr. Ghazi, I have a question, please. Can, can I just take your name, please? My name is Rizwan. Thank you, Dr. Rizwan, yes. Uh, just a question that uh, is, does it happen that while breaking bad news, if the relative becomes physical with you, so what oh, would be okay. the scenario? I, either out of so, uh, anger or either uh, through emotions, that's what I want to know. Okay, uh, it's a valid question, valid question, because it's a very emotional station, right? You've just broken a very bad news to a family member who was not expecting this news to come up. So they will be emotional, different people to behave differently. In real life, yes, they might get physical in real life, but in an OSCE station, I've never come across 
that they will pick up physical. They might raise their voice. They might raise your, their tone. They might, I mean, they will show anger by speech, but they will not show anger by physically attacking you in the Oski scenario. Because remember, those are actors. They've been told to go to a certain extent, but do not exceed that extent. So they know their limitations. But in real life, I've seen people becoming physical, but certainly not in OSCE scenario. But then again, if somebody is raising their voice, becoming aggressive, then you automatically switch, switch yourself from breaking bad news to conflict resolution, all right? So there's a different template you have to follow for conflict resolution, which you have to encompass in the breaking bad news, okay? Uh, it's a good question, but unlikely to have any case in that. Okay. Sir, I have a question. Can I just take your name? Uh, I'm Dr. Mufti. Thank you, Dr. Um, yeah. My question is that sometimes these actors roam around the room, and uh, which is very difficult to manage. So is there a way uh, we can, uh, can we talk with them while they roam around the room, or we have to make them sit down? Or what is the trick to manage this thing? Excellent, excellent question, uh, Dr. Mufti. Uh, this is a typical, this typically happens in a psychiatry station, in a manic station. And this happens. You are very rightly right to point out this station. It's a very important station. And if this station unluckily comes to your exam, you should be prepared to tackle this. And the candidates who can tackle this will pass the exam. Yes, there are certain tricks to diffuse the situation, to calm that person down. But I will discuss this only in psychiatry's communication skills station, okay? But it certainly happens, it comes, and there are certain ways how you deal with those, okay? But Dr. Uh, Mufti will have to park the station in the psychiatry. Uh, what we don't want to do is uh, jumble everything together today, okay? We're going to keep, very good question, but we're going to focus just on breaking bad news. Any simple questions about the session today? Dr. Kazi, I have a question. Dr. Kazi, yes, yes. Dr. Kazi uh, uh, do you recommend a spikes approach for the breaking bad news? Um, yes, yes, yes. You can certainly uh, use a spike approach. That's, that's no harm in those. That you can certainly do that. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down which approach you're comfortable with. Uh, if you're comfortable with the spike approach, it's absolutely fine. Setting the scene. I mean, it's, there's, no, uh, there's no issues with those. But the, 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 you, the thing I used to do, so these points, if you uh, look at it, are uh, approximately, I've just, uh, one second, yeah. Uh, next time I'm gonna make sure I'm a bit more techy, uh, because this is the first time I'm doing a Zoom session. Okay, if you can uh, focus this, the first step I thought about was setting. In the setting I talked about private room, chaperone, turning the bleep off, introduction, my name, my designation, what was my, my role. Uh, the third one is thanking for the feed. Thank you for coming to meet me. Can I just confirm who you are? Um, then assessing how much they know uh, so that I can start from there onwards. Uh, giving the information, the relevant information from the information forward, what they know. Uh, then to summarize, warning short, the breaking bad news, giving the silence, offering support, calling the relative if they need to, religious views and organ donation, okay? Keeping patient comfortable and giving you privacy to see the patient and avail availability, I'm available, okay? So these are, I say it's 13, but actually it's 15 in total, okay? So once you follow this pattern, you've already ticked 15 uh, ticks. The rest, of the rest of the five to six texts will depend on the situation what you faced with. Uh, this was a pretty straightforward case, right? Uh, like I think. Uh, Dr. Alaikum, Dr. Masood. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, this is Dr. Gulam Rasul with you from uh, Oman. Thank you yes. very much for uh, giving us a very good uh, 
uh, orientation about those Bye. diagram. I have one question about that. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Dr. Yes, Mashud, actually, I have the question regarding the breaking bad news. Outside on the uh, door, there is always the pie chart about the uh, uh, what I have to go and discuss with the uh, inside relative of the misdemeanor, whatever is inside. So, do I have to go and request for the notes of the regarding the patient yes. condition from yes. the examiner he's sitting there, or I have to just focus whatever I have reached from the outside? Good question. Good question. Good question. <laughs> Okay, just one second. All right, uh, uh, good question, Dr. Evola. If there is a case, such as the case which we just uh, talked about, is a complicated case, intracranial bleeding, low GCS, neurosurgeons, ICU have been consulted, they might give you a big CT scan showing uh, bleed. Generally, you shouldn't be able to request more notes. Generally, you shouldn't be able to request more notes. Whatever information you've been provided on that scenario, uh, you should be able to uh, get relevant information from there and then provide it to the relative, whoever is there. As a rule, in stations, you don't have, you don't necessarily need to request extra notes. Um, I've never come across any scenario where a candidate has to request extra notes because what the college examiner wants you to do is digest the information they've given you. Mind you, these stations, they can have half a page information, right? So my information is only a quarter of a page. They might give you information up to here. Read that information within a minute, it would be really difficult. So that's where your reading skills come into play. Now, what the, can, what the patient relative might ask you is if there's a big bleed, like an intracranial bleed, and there's a plain CT scan printed out, uh, there will be a copy outside, there will be a copy inside. You can just request, uh, would you like to see the CT scan? All right, then at that point, the examiner will pass on the CT scan copy to you. Then you can explain to the person, look, this is a big, uh, this is the brain, the bleed is all over the brain. There is no space for the brain left. It's all bleed, uh, all bleed. So that's why our experts neurosurgeon has suggested um, it's not for any treatment. So answering back to your question, there essentially is no need to request more uh, uh, notes. All the information you need will be present. Uh, I've never come across or heard across uh, any, quest, uh, any need for requesting other questions. Uh, I will have to apologize because I haven't, uh, I just realized there are 49 uh, chats, uh, 49, uh, I mean, entries on the chat. I've not been able to look at the chat, so my apologies. I know some of you guys are putting questions in the chat, but uh, I wasn't- Yes, I, wa yeah, okay. I wanted to ask one question, I'm, I'm Shalini. Uh, so, Dr. Kazi, uh, how do we approach uh, asking for organ donation in a breaking bad news as the relative is extremely sad at that time? Oh, okay, good, excellent. So, uh, so, so can I add to this question? Yes, please, yes. I wanted to add to this question. Suppose uh, I ask him and the uh, relative becomes very aggressive at that point of time. So how would we manage that? So okay. both the questions, please. That's fine. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. All right. So uh, remember these uh, <coughs> exams are based for NHS. In the NHS, the organ donation is a very common theme and common topic. Uh, most of the patients or relatives are very well aware in the British culture about organ donation. So for them to be asked about organ donation, it's almost a normal thing. They are, uh, in a way, they are expecting you to ask them about organ donation uh, because it's just such a common thing to happen in, in just hospitals. So it's not a question which is coming out of the blue. I know certain parts of the world, organ donation is very difficult to ask. Uh, even if you ask, it, it seems like you're asking a very bad question. But in NHS practice, it's a normal question to ask about organ donation. If for example, you've asked about organ donation, the patient haven't got a clue whether the, the relative who's passed away uh, had any views about organ donation or not, that's fine. You can say to them, I will, I will give you a leaflet which has information about organ donation. 
when you have time, you can read through the leaflet. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask the organ donation team and the contact details are given in the leaflet. Or you can ask us, okay? Uh, if uh, they have discussed organ donation, the person has passed away, then you simply say, okay, what we'll do is we'll get in touch with the organ donation team and they will, uh, will inform them uh, about the relative who's, uh, who's died and they will contact you. Uh, the other thing is, uh, aggressive, if the person becomes aggressive, A, they wouldn't, B, if they do, uh, then you just have to calm things down. Uh, the first thing about dealing with aggression, uh, if after you've asked questions, is to apologize. You can just say, just say, you can just say, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Manta. I didn't want to make you upset. If uh, if organization, if you're not comfortable talking about organization, we're not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, please accept. I'm really sorry that you, uh, I've upset it you. So you try to get out of that situation. Uh, if if person has become aggressive or offended by you asking organization, a they wouldn't need to do, then you apologize and just come out of the situation and go back to your uh, the trail you follow. Okay? All right. Okay. So, Hello. Yeah. Hi, Doc. Yes. Yeah, this is Dr. Bominini from Bahamas. <clears throat> Doc, uh, if, if suddenly, like, if you break the bad news, you said, like, patient, your father died. If the patient, like, the person suddenly started to, like, uh, become violent, like, because she, they couldn't be able to understand or digest the situation, if they started to blame you, like, you guys didn't take care and you guys, you guys did kill my father like if they started to uh, comment like that how can we respond sure. okay so if, if for example if you were the person who's saying these things back to me i would say uh, i can understand your feelings i'm really sorry about your loss um, but i wanted to reassure you that we did everything what we could uh, we had the whole resuscitation team uh, involved uh, we had intensive care doctors the medical doctors and the emergency department doctors uh, working together. Uh, so the so first thing is you apologize in these scenarios, right? Uh, so uh, I apologize uh, about your loss. I apologize you feeling this way. Uh, but what, what, the, the thing would not be nice to say is, I know how you feel because I, I don't know how you feel because I haven't lost a loved one, you have lost a loved one. So what you can do is, uh, I, I apologize about your loss. I'm really sorry about your loss. I'm sorry I, I, I upset at you, but I want to reassure that uh, we did everything what we could. And then you go a bit more into the detail that because it was a cardiac arrest, there were multiple teams which were involved, they were all working together. But unfortunately, we couldn't save him. Instead of saying I, that I couldn't save your relative, you can say, uh, uh, there were multiple teams working together, and unfortunately, uh, we couldn't save uh, your relative or Mr. Smith, in spite of all the measures what we could. Okay? Right. Uh, what we do is... Okay, one last question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am Dr. Tundur from Saudi Arabia. How are you? Thank you, Dr. Mishwot. Really yes. appreciate your work and your concerns and really uh, practical and uh, tips you have told. Uh, that will guide us to pass this exam, inshallah. Sure. Uh, question is uh, simply, if such a person who um, waste a time, start crying and crying and not listening, and uh, in that scenario, can we offer something to that person to be calmed down, some like water juice or some painkiller, something like that? Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, yes, certainly you can. If somebody starts crying, A, you need to give them time, uh, you, need, you need to give them space. Uh, so you can give them five to 10 seconds to weep and cry. After that, I mean, remember, you can't give them the whole six minutes to cry, right? You have to intervene. So you give them five, 10 seconds to cry out. Then you say, could I offer you some tissues, okay? Uh, then you offer them tissues. If they're still not settling, um, you like us to 
get you a cup of tea or coffee, which is absolutely fine to say, because that becomes a human to human contact. That becomes, you, you really caring of the person you're talking to. That's a very good idea to offer them coffee, tea, tissues, and give them some space uh, and time so they can uh, vent out their frustration, emotions, and things like that, okay? Right, what we'll do guys is we have, uh, I really enjoyed the session today. We had, at one point we had uh, 96 participants, uh, which is, uh, my aim was just to start off with 10, so we could have more one-to-one -one meeting, but it turned out we ended up having 96. Uh, because I'm using, I was using a basic Zoom version, I could only give 100 forms. So for 96 people to turn up from 100 forms is a very good, attendance rate, I think 96%, so the, uh, well done to you all. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed talking to you guys because you are a very highly intellectual guys. All the questions which you have asked are asked, all the participants who have asked those questions are very sensible. Uh, there have not been a single question which has been out of the line. You uh, guys have very well behaved, considering at one point we had 96 people uh, you have maintained um, uh, the rules which are set out that you mute and then when the question comes up, so I have to give them full marks to you guys, which we don't get to do in uh, live sessions because in live sessions everybody wants to ask questions and in fact, which is fine. What we'll do is we'll, so we focused on the basics of OSCE communication skills. What we want to do is build on this in the future sessions, okay? Uh, you can, you have to do your basic OSCE reading from any book you want, uh, any template you want to follow, just follow. What we'll do, we'll fine tune as we're doing different sessions, like we'll have to focus on uh, separate three, four sessions for history, then there are going to be a couple of sessions for psychiatry, because psychiatry session has to come in the exam. There's no way, there's never been an exam, or there have been, I don't know, that a psychiatry station hasn't come. We have to practice again breaking bad news, but we have to ramp up the intensity. Then we need to do a few resuscitation stations as well. Okay, uh, then difficult consultation we have to do. We have to do um, uh, teachings. Now teaching scenarios can come and will come about teaching a medical student, advanced practitioner or a junior doctor, then we'll do that as well. I hope you have enjoyed this session. And what we'll do is I will be putting on a different YouTube videos just for practicing. Do subscribe to the channel if you can. And uh, I'm putting on some material on my Facebook page. Do like it if you can. Uh, if you have any feedback, please put it on the Facebook page or email us, uh, we'd really like to see your feedback and how things, we can, or tell us things which we can do differently next time. What I think I need to um, do sessions with maximum 10 people in because uh, I will have to give everybody individual time, one-to-one -one, uh, sessions uh, because 96, patient, 96 candidates, I don't think it's fair to give one-to-one -one session, but we will work out something, we'll work out something. Okay. Yes, Giri. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Thank so you. I may finish off. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank no you problem. so much. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazi. Take care. Take care.